What are residuals anyway? In this episode, I want to answer that question, specifically, what are residuals, how do residuals figure in model assumptions, and how do residuals relate to random intercepts in a mixed effects model? Well, residuals are kind of what they sound like. They're the leftovers. They're what the model doesn't account for. Let's look at a study as an example of residuals. So the dependent variable is the frequency of expressions like he ended up sighing, they ended up going, we always end up seeing, those sorts of expressions. The independent variable is the decade. So if we plot the frequency of end up verbing expressions per decade, so here I plotted the frequency per million of end up verbing expressions by decade and plotted a regression line onto it, which is the line that is closest to all of the data points. And that line represents the model's predictions. The closer the data points are to the model, the better the model is, the better predictions the model makes. So the residuals are the distance from the data points to the regression line. So if a residual is above the regression line, it has a positive number. If it's below the regression line, it has a negative number. One way to think about the residuals is they represent what the model isn't accounting for. So why are residuals important? Well, many assumptions refer to residuals. For example, residuals must be normally distributed. Many people misunderstand that to mean that the data must be normally distributed. No, it's the residuals. When the residuals are plotted against the predictions the model makes, there must not be any kind of pattern to that plot. When the residuals are plotted against the predictions the model makes, there must not be any pattern. That is, they must be heteroscedastic. And residuals must not be correlated. So let's look at another example study. The dependent variable is how long it takes people to respond to the word. The independent variables are the word type, the number of phonological neighbors, and the word's frequency. So this is what it looks like in Jamovi. Under options, so this is what it looks like in Jamovi. You put the dependent and the independent variables in, and an important thing you need to do is under the options drop-down menu, check predicted and residuals. What that does is when Jamovi runs the analysis, it makes two new columns of data, the model's prediction and the residuals of the model. So are the residuals normally distributed? Well, it's a simple thing to look at it. Make a histogram of the residuals by going to Explore Descriptives and check Histogram. And as you can tell, it doesn't fit under a nice bell curve. It's very positively skewed. So the distribution of the residuals does not meet the assumptions. Are the residuals heteroscedastic? To look at this, we need to plot the residuals against the predictions. In Jamovi, go to Explore, Scatter Plot, put the new variables that Jamovi has created on the X and Y axes. And what you can see is that they are not evenly distributed. They are more densely packed toward the bottom. So the heteroscedasticity of the residuals has been violated also. So how do you take care of this? Well, reaction times are notorious for resulting in models that violate assumptions. So I took care of this by converting the reaction times into their natural log, and I rerun the study. And now you can see that the residuals fit a lot better into a bell curve, and they're now heteroscedastic. In other words, they're evenly scattered all over the plot. What about correlated residuals? Well, generally, we only have to worry about correlated residuals when there are repeated measures. In other words, when one participant gives several different responses. For example, a slow participant's responses are all going to be related. They're all going to be slower than average. So let's look at some more corpus data. How about the expression try and verb? For example, I tried and cut it. In contrast to, I tried to cut it. Let's look at its frequency over time. And let's consider data from two corpora, Time Magazine and the Corpus of Historical American English. So what you see is that the yellow dots are from the Corpus of Historical American English, and they are all higher than the blue dots that come from Time Magazine. So all of the, co all of the data from Koha are going to have positive residuals, and all the data from Time are going to have negative residuals. Let's look at the same data, but on a different plot. All the Koha residuals are above the line are, and are going to have positive residuals, and all the time residuals are below the line 
and are going to have negative residuals. So correlated residuals violate the assumptions, and what that means is that the results of the analysis are invalid. So what's the solution? Well, we need to give each corpus, in this case, its own line. In this plot, we see that the COHA residuals and the time residuals have their own line now. And if you look at the COHA residuals, some of them are below the COHA line and some are above, so they're not going to be correlated. The same is true of the time data. Some are above the time line and others are below the timeline. In other words, the residuals are no longer correlated and the model no longer violates the assumptions. So how do you go about giving each corpus or participant or test word, for example, its own line? Well, it's simple. You run a mixed effects model and include a random intercept for corpus, participant, or word. I hope this episode makes the idea of residuals and how they figure into statistical analyses more clear. <laughs>